Welcome to the Daily Objective, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Tabengen. Uh, today, I'm going to do a, a book review on um, the Marxification of Education by James Lindsay. It's a book I recently read, and I, I quite enjoyed it. It had some some flaws, but I thought I'd do a little review where I share some of my biggest takeaways from the book, and you know, maybe have a few criticisms of it, uh, but generally just share share what I took away and, and learn from it. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, I, I've worked on a number of education projects in over the past decade. And in the last year, I've focused exclusively on education products and, and building them um, with Lisa Van Dam. Uh, so this book, The Marxification of Education is by James Lindsay. Um, if you're not familiar with him, I definitely recommend checking out his podcast called The New Discourses. He's an intellectual that focuses mostly on critical theory, Marxism, and, and wokeism, um, helping you understand it and, you know, providing arguments against it and, and just uh, untangling it. You may have heard his name in relation to Peter Boghossian uh, and, and, and may have heard of them on the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, they did a series of studies or, or fake papers a number of years ago that they actually were able to get published. They were called the grievance studies. It's quite funny. Um, and, and so James Lindsay was part of that. Uh, I, I believe one of the studies looked at, um, it, they took uh, excerpts from Mein Kampf and replaced, replaced I think, just the word Jew and, and got that published. And I think one of their other papers uh, tried to present an argument for how uh, rape culture was related to dog parks um, in some way. So it's really funny. Uh, I recommend checking it out. And his latest book is The Marxification of Education. It, it's a bit of a manual. It's a very short book. He calls it a manual or refers to it as a manual. And um, it's specifically about Paulo Freira, who's a Brazilian intellectual that focuses on philosophy of education and pedagogy. Uh, so um, this book called The Marxification of Education is about Paulo Freire's uh, ideas. And what I want to share in this review is just a few takeaways uh, that I found particularly interesting um, from the book, things that, that opened my eyes a little bit to um, the ideas and their impact on society. So one thing that um, James Lindsay does point out in the book or does claim in the book is that Paulo Fiera is one of the most influential um, thinkers in education on Western education. So in, he's one of the most cited um, theorists in education schools and teacher training colleges. So it's worth kind of paying attention to what he has to say, if that's in case correct. Um, he was did most of his work in the 60s and 70s where he wrote his book. His most famous book is called The Pedagogy of the uh, Oppressed. And uh, I'll give a kind of brief summary of some of my, my biggest takeaways from him and from what James Lindsay had to say about him. So he looks at education through a Marxist lens. And one thing I really liked and got a lot of value out of James Lindsay's presentation is he gave a bit of an overview of what it means to look at something through a Marxist lens or also how you can make a critical theory out of anything. So kind of at its most fundamental, my understanding is that a Marxist view is that of looking at society in terms of a power struggle, in terms of those with power and those without power, or in other words, of those who are the oppressors, and those who are the oppressed. And in any structure, the oppressors will maintain their power through some mechanism. So they use some mechanism or they structure society in such a way in order to remain in power and in order to remain the oppressors. In economics, you know, the most kind of classical Marxism or, or most familiar uh, Marxist ideas we're probably familiar with, the means of oppression is capital, right? So you have the bourgeoisie who are the oppressors and the proletariat who are the oppressed. And the mechanism or the way society is organized is that in order to have power, you need capital. And so capital becomes this mechanism of oppression. And uh, another term for capital is also the means of production. 
And you can look at society in this kind of class struggle between the oppressors and the oppressed and the mechanism by which they retain their power over the oppressed. And another important part um, James Lindsay presents is that in a Marxist perspective, the goal becomes to awaken the oppressed to their position, right? Make them aware because often they're not even aware that they're they're being oppressed. Um, so step number one is awaken them to their position in society and then um, help them take action. Uh, this is often called praxis. So awaken them and then get them to take action into this revolution um, that will change the structure of society. And so this is kind of the formula that James Lindsay presents at the core of, of um, a Marxist idea. And he gives a few examples of how you can take this perspective and apply it to anything, right? Take this idea and turn a critical theory out of anything. So, you know, he provides a few other examples. For example, um, in the space of, of race, right? We've heard of critical race theory. Uh, so in the, in the domain of race, um, the oppressors are white people and the oppressed are people of color. And the mechanism by which they oppress is whiteness or white ideas or white culture. And you've kind of heard that lingo in the in our society a little bit more. So it's kind of interesting to hear uh, James Lindsay formulate it this way. So you can have a critical race theory um, that looks at our society through that kind of structural organization of the oppressors as the white people and the oppressed as people of color. You can apply that to gender as well. So in gender, you kind of have cisgender who are the oppressors, um, you know, non-binary, I guess, would be the oppressed and the mechanism that they're oppressing are, you know, cisgender ideas. So for example, they, I, I think they would probably say that just having male, female bathrooms is a structural form of oppression that, you know, allows uh, cisgender people to retain their power in society. And so following this trend, Paulo Freira, according to James Lindsay, will look at education through this lens as well. And so for him, the mechanism of oppression is literacy. So the idea is that by its nature, by its, the structure of how we educate, setting the standards of you know the traditional the tradition of western education of learning to read mathematics history etc you can kind of bundle these into literacy those are the mechanisms by which the current powerful class will oppress um you know the other other classes the oppressed and so the nature of how we educate is built to help people retain power so literacy as such is a mechanism, a tool um, for the oppressors. And because of this, Paulo Freire says, the goal is of, of education needs to be reorganized to orient the oppressed around their situation, right? Kind of to awaken them to their current situation and help them take action. And so that's what a lot of his education um, is about, is Oh, ma making you aware to the fact that what you're being taught is uh, a, just a mechanism uh, to have power over you and then to take action in this. And so another takeaway I, I, I got from the book is just what this sort of idea implies. It kind of implies that the standards or the mechanisms are arbitrary, right? Literacy is not good because, you know, there's values that you obtain as a human being, learning to read, learning mathematics. Um, no, it's it's there not for any objective reason, but because it allows the oppressors to retain their power. And you'll kind of hear lingo like it excludes other ways of knowing. Um, so you can kind of spot a critical theory when they start talking about the mechanism in subjective terms and also being exclusionary of other forms that are equally valid. Now, to be fair to, to Paulo Fieri, he doesn't say that literacy is bad. 
right? Or that learning math is bad, as far as I know. It's, it's just that it becomes secondary. And what he elevates as the primary purpose of education is what he calls political literacy. And the political literacy is that idea of awakening, is it's becoming aware of your political situation, right? Literate, right? Or, or um, uh, competent about your political situation as either an oppressor or a part of the oppressed class and to become awakened to it so that you can then take action. And so that was very enlightening for me too, to, to understand that relationship. And so the goal of education for, for free area becomes to awaken the people similar to how you would awaken the proletariat and to take action. And so a lot of fear's lessons then become really interesting. And this was kind of my second big takeaway um, where James Lindsay presented some examples of what lessons may look like. Now, here is where I thought the book was a little bit weaker in its presentation. The examples he provided were ones he created or contrived, not necessarily ones that he was recording from classroom observations, which I would have loved to see. Um, so it's hard for me to know how authentic these examples are, but I'll at least share a couple with you so you at least understand what James Lindsay's perspective on a free area in education is. So I think an easier example to wrap your head around would be how you might um, teach political literacy in, let's say, history class. So um, the, the goal of the teacher is to create a dialogue and to do that through what they call generative themes. So a generative theme, from my understanding, is um, you know, a discussion topic that generates a conversation that draws awareness to this power structure or power struggle. So in history class, you may you know, talk about slavery, right? An example of slavery, a particular um, incident that happened in history, or just slavery as a whole. And then you'll talk about the injustices involved. And one really interesting thing is you'll you'll make an emphasis of having the students emotionally connect with one of the classes in the struggle. So if you have students of color in your class, you'll ask them what it what how they would feel if they were in the shoes of the slaves. And you might ask the white people to put themselves in the shoes of the slave owners. And this is really troubling to me, and I can only imagine the psychological consequences that could have of forcing yourself as a, a young person, right, a student, a child, to think of yourself and imagine yourself as a slave owner, the kind of guilt that, that, would, that would come with that. And then also, you know, just as damaging to think of yourself, if you're a colored person, about how you relate to a, a slave. And despite not being a slave, thinking of yourself as one, I can imagine, is very troubling uh, and very, very harmful. So that's one example. He gives another example from a math class that I thought was particularly interesting and horrifying, if true. Uh, I tend to be a bit of a benevolent and naive person, so I often have a hard time wrapping my head around instances of evil. But if this is true, uh, I'm really horrified for the state of education. So here's an example of how a teacher could introduce a generative theme into a math class. So he gives a, you know, a typical math word problem uh, where it looks at like something in terms of, um, you know, you and your mom are on your way to an amusement park. The amusement park is six miles away. Uh, you're two miles there. You've traveled two miles. How many miles do you have left? So a very simple math word problem. And maybe you do the, the you, you get the answer out of it. But to make it generative, what the teacher can do is ask the class, how many students have ever been to an amusement park and how many have not? They can then use that as an opportunity to discuss why some people haven't been to an amusement park and kind of lead and steer the conversation towards a discussion over inequality, right? Why? Some people can't afford to go to an amusement park. And so even this kind of innocuous 
simple math problem Lindsay presents could be turned into a generative conversation about um, you know, this power struggle. And my kind of takeaway is if this is true, and if this is the kind of thing that happens, I can see how every you become trained as a student to look for class struggles or structural inequality or social justice issues everywhere in society. If every lesson is somehow turned into a conversation about this, then it kind of seems natural that as a student, once you graduate or once you leave school, that's kind of going to be the lens through which you look at everything. That's what you're going to be good at. So that kind of gets me to a bit of a summary on what I really liked from the book and what I thought was was lacking. Um, so first, I, I really thought it was a good introduction to the ideas. Um, I thought it provided a lot of clarity on what some essentials of a Marxist idea was and how you could how what, what we're seeing around us is the result of applying you know a fundamental aspect of marxism to other fields and it's something you hear in you know society a lot now just the idea of um the uh looking for power struggles and um, looking at the mechanism by which oppressors retain their power so that was really interesting to, to learn about. Also learning some of the ways in which that is done were very interesting. Uh, what I did find was lacking in the book was, you know, as I mentioned before, more examples and statistics. He mentions that Paulo Freire is very influential and that he's one of the most cited uh, intellectuals in teacher training colleges, but he doesn't provide examples of what teachers are being taught specifically like what a, a lesson in teacher training would look like, how as a teacher or prospective teacher, um, you would be introduced to the ideas. He doesn't provide many statistics on, or any statistics as far as I remember on, um, you know, how many teachers colleges use his works. So that part's a little lacking. And then also um, when it comes to understanding Ferrer's ideas, actually um, seeing a lot of examples of what that looks like in the classroom what an actual lesson would look like. But despite that, you know, the grounding in ideas, the basic introduction was really helpful because it does, at least for me, explain a lot of the anecdotal things I'm seeing around me in society, right? James Lindsay does claim that, you know, our West, our schools in the West are dominated by Freirean thought. And even though he doesn't provide a lot of evidence, it seems plausible to me that that this is accurate. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more instances of activism dominating our culture, right? Looking for every opportunity to make something a social justice uh, battle. Um, the Free Press did an article um, a few weeks ago with actual statistics on the rise of activism of protests over the last uh, few decades. So. Um, um, this, that I think is plausible to me. Um, you know, you're hearing in the business world, for example, many more instances of employees directing conversation towards social justice issues. Um, if you haven't already, I would really recommend looking into a story from uh, Basecamp. If you're familiar with Basecamp, the company with James Freed and David Heinemer Hansen, uh, they're real heroes. They're wonderful business people, but um, you know, I think this was last year or a year or two ago, they essentially paid a bunch of their employees to leave the company and they drew a hard line and said, our company will not be about social justice. When you come to work, it's meant for work, not for social justice. We don't want our Slack channels dominated by conversations about social justice. So those are just a few anecdotal examples of the direction we've seen culture going in. but. It does seem very consistent with Freire's stated goals. So from that perspective, I, I think this book is worth reading as a basic introduction to the ideas. Now, one hope I have is that somebody more intellectual than myself, like, you know, maybe Nikos, will take up the charge of doing a bit of a deeper dive into, into Paulo Freire's thought and his influence and maybe do a more rigorous presentation of uh, the influence on our current education system. But 
In the meantime, I can recommend this book as something worth reading as a general introduction. Uh, so before I wrap up here, I'll just go through some of the super chats. There are a few questions in here uh, that I'll I'll uh, look at. So first of all, thank you, Mary Elaine, uh, for your super chats. Um, she says, you know, political literacy sounds really boring. I'd rather just live my life in found. In, in fact, political literacy sounds oppressive. And yeah, I'd agree. Just the whole idea of looking at the world in terms of oppressors and oppressed is cynical and self-reinforcing. One thing that's also interesting in James Lindsay's presentation is that um, you never stop according to a Marxist theory. So once you've overthrown or restructured society, you always have to be looking for what replaces it as the new form of oppression. So there's never this like state of peace, it seems. It's this constant struggle and constant um, um, there's this constant need to awaken and restructure society. Uh, from Travis, we have a question. Didn't Lindsay explore the classroom in Africa uh, where the students either started attacking the teacher for being part of the system or just withdrawing into a nothing that can be done depression? That's actually what Paulo Freire did, or at least followers of him did. So I think Paulo Freire started in uh, you know rural Brazilian communities where he started talking with farmers and then another study was done in Africa as well. And that that is part of James Lindsay's analysis. So he does present uh, what Paulo, what, how those look as example lessons. And yeah, um, what ended up happening, they would show them images of, you know, ways of looking at their oppressed position as rural farmers. And before they could learn to read, they became so emotional and violent that and um, incensed to change that there wasn't actually any time for the literacy part of political literacy. Um, another question is, um, isn't uh, from, from Bonnie, isn't Freer's basic premise that force still rules in human relationships? I would say so. Like, you know, the idea is that society is, you know, built on these power struggles that there is people in power and those who are being oppressed by the powerful and that these mechanisms are really force on them. Um, so yeah, uh, Chandler also asks, is this a review by James Lindsay? So yeah, James Lindsay is not a critical Marxist thinker. He's a critic of, of uh, Marxism and critical theory. He wrote this book as a review of Paulo Fieri's thought and as a warning to everyone to, to learn about these ideas and, you know, counteract them and hopefully intervene before, you know, in his, in his mind, a whole generation of our, our culture is brainwashed. He does in his book equate what happens in a Freire classroom to, you know, what would go on in, in a gulag or in, in some of the um, Chinese thought reform camps. So he's pretty extreme about, uh, about the consequences of, these ideas of, of the Paulo Freire ideas and, and you can't blame them with what you're seeing in society right now. So um, I hope you found this valuable, um, gave you a little bit of a taste of, of what this book is about and, and hopefully you're interested and inspired to go, to go out and read it. Um, uh, so we'll wrap up there. Thank you everyone. And um, there's a episode of the daily collective right after this. So stick around for that. Thanks everyone.